our lives are at further risk. There's a common narrative that what we see in present day New Orleans is the result of our own past actions or inaction. When you got to go to the grocery store with your gun on your pocket, that's a war zone. History and data connects our present day problems to past policy. 15 an hour. Policies designed to limit or really even eliminate opportunities in minority communities. When will this stop? Policies whose legacies have become so institutionalized that while the physical line has been erased, the mental and social line remains. If you really want to address crime, you got to think about the nucleus of the problem. So could a line drawn generations ago result in the poverty, crime, lack of education, and many other issues some New Orleanians face today? And we're doing the same old crazy, insane things over and over and over again. I never crave a po' boy because I don't eat bread like that. Shoot. I <laughs> I'm going to get me a hot sausage with cheese. <laughs> oh, this is cool. Look at this place. Right. That's oh, my kind really of place, great. man. Shoot. These are all black books, too. Dr. Eric Johnson has worked in urban development and real estate development in cities across America, but he's a native New Orleanian. Alumnus of Walter L. Cohen. Senior high school. Yeah, you, you know how New Orleans is. Right. right? First question is where you go to school? You know, I moved a lot when I was a child growing up, but predominantly grew up uh, in uptown New Orleans. That was really sort of the, the origins of my life experience uptown New Orleans. This is especially kind of this little. Area. Our origin story can shape who we become. Well, the same can be said for New Orleans' origin story. A line Dr. Johnson says traces back to the early wealthy settlers who purchased the highland in New Orleans. Before the Civil War, African Americans and whites in the city, they were sort of mixing in a little socially um, and physically and economically. New Orleans was rather unique in this sense, thanks to the large population of free people of color living amongst whites and the enslaved. And right after the Civil War, we start to see a city that becomes moving towards a greater segregated city. Right after Reconstruction, when African Americans were making progress, here comes Jim Crow. Let's knock it out of the box. It takes away that sort of progress. The decision in the Plessy v. Ferguson case was polarizing. Jim Crow's separate but equal laws went into effect, intensifying hostility and division. We're heading into the early part of the 20th century, there is this sort of movement that's starting to happen to say, wait a minute, we need to start to separate ourselves from African Americans. Part of that movement was the enactment of racial zoning laws, meaning neighborhoods could explicitly say only black people or white people could live in them. When the Supreme Court deemed those unconstitutional in 1917, the city of New Orleans enacted its own racial zoning laws in 1924, also deemed unconstitutional. Right after the Supreme Court said that we couldn't create neighborhoods based on race, we developed another tool that accomplished the same result, and that is single family zoning. Stacy Sheck Snyder is a professor of law at Tulane University. It created single family zones for whites only, and the only use that was allowed in the neighborhood was a single family home. So any other uses, apartments, industrial uses, commercial uses, things that were hazardous, all the other uses that were restricted and kept out of single family zones were allowed in black neighborhoods and that sort of created the scaffolding for redlining. Great Depression. The idea was let's jumpstart the construction industry through home ownership. Here comes the HOLC, Home Owners Loan Corporation that now creates these maps that starts to divide cities. New Orleans is no different. Banks came in and they saw white neighborhoods were created to be the most desirable neighborhoods. Black neighborhoods were overcrowded and they were side by side with all kinds of hazardous uses. And so, of course, it was easy for banks to say, well, we're only gonna invest in single family neighborhoods. Those are the neighborhoods that are gonna get the green designation on the redlining map and black neighborhoods that were set up as overcrowded and hazardous places were of course given the red designation on the map. The blue color represented neighborhoods still considered desirable while the yellow indicated a neighborhood was definitely declining. It helped institutionalize a system where 
um, if you were black, you were not able to get a loan yourself. But neighborhoods where blacks lived were also not uh, deemed acceptable for investment. And so even whites who lived in black neighborhoods were not able to get loans. These maps started to define the boundaries. These communities were in a sense designated for failure through tactics of exclusion now supported by the federal government. You started to see African Americans become more contained in areas, let's say, like a central city. Four people were shot and a fifth was killed in a shooting in Central City. Wednesday in Central City, a 19-year-old was in a car when someone started shooting. They cut all the programs out for our black children. The origins of Central City go back to the 1800s when it was mostly occupied by immigrants like the Irish, Germans and Italians, and soon African Americans. The Data Research Center described the area as a large, mosquito-infested and swampy area that was below sea level. The homes are mostly clustered tightly together and done shotgun style with a large percent of renters. Essentially, on the red line map, all of this would be red line, yes. including where we are actually headed towards. And can you tell us, like, if we're walking a physical line here, where would the line stop? That line, you cross St. Charles Avenue on the other side, uh, you start to get more into the green category. The streetcar line is a natural boundary, right? That begins to create sort of a different uh, feel and a, some could call it a barricade to the other side. Natural barricades, some unnatural barricades, creates um, a sort of distinction and separation. A separation that is only minutes, if not seconds apart. If you're gonna contain people, they don't have access to the growth of the economy, mobility where economic opportunities are, and this whole thing is moving generation after generation. Dr. Johnson says concentrated poverty and segregation not only limits social and economic opportunity, but it's the impetus of the racial wealth gap in New Orleans. The only way you get wealth in this country, if you are either low income or middle, is through home ownership, the equity built there. But imagine you don't have the ability to own a home or purchase, or if you did buy a house, you have interest rates that are so high because the federal government will not insure you to get a loan through the bank. You pair that with a lack of investment, low wage jobs, and substandard education, your racial zone and red line zone becomes a disaster zone, leaving a lot of our responses to modern day issues superficial. Where is the facility? We went from integration to gentrification. This is not justice because no one can achieve justice under an unjust system that prioritizes profit over people. The housing piece and the ability to create wealth to pass on to each generation is the glue that has created the situation we have. From the pre 1930s, uh -huh. all the way to about 1970 or so, the amount of homes built in New Orleans. And if you do a simple calculation on what those houses sold for back then and what they sell for today, right? Right. And how much loss wealth as a result of that. That, you basically froze it out of it. You gotta think about that. Right. That, that is like massive. So you don't have any, you don't have any equity in a home. You're not able to build any wealth. No, and you have nothing to pass on. Imagine if we were all given a fair shake, how different this city could be. Our lives are at further risk. There's a common narrative that what we see in present day New Orleans is the result of our own past actions or inaction. Come and throw me out of my home that I don't work and pay it for. History and data connects our present day problems to past policy. 15 an hour. Policies designed to limit or really even eliminate opportunities in minority communities. If I lose my job, where am I going? Policies whose legacies have become so institutionalized that while the physical line has been erased, 
the mental and social line remains. Living in a car, being depressed, being stressed out, not having food to eat is not an excuse. So could a line drawn generations ago result in the poverty, crime, lack of education, and many other issues some New Orleanians face today. Until we start investing in people and put the political agendas aside, the city is gonna continue to burn. How do we get to this point? Why are these attitudes, how have these attitudes become so kind of prevalent and, and ingrained in us to think this way? Like even when we think about the, the neighborhoods, the communities, well, those people don't want to, and I hear those people a lot. They don't want this. Those people don't want to do these things or yeah. pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And, but you're and, not going to say what caused you to be in a position to try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We follow the line from the origin story of New Orleans to the Civil War, Reconstruction and Jim Crow laws to racial zoning laws, single family zoning, then redlining. It's a line that left a trail of barriers for African-Americans, one that's generations long. But the tactics of exclusion didn't stop there. Back in the old days, we actually had racial covenants where you know you were required um, to only you know sell to a certain race. If any property owner tries to transfer the property to a black resident, then anyone in the neighborhood can sue to enforce the covenant. If it's enforced, it could mean that a black homeowner could be evicted from the property that they purchased. And that's not even if they, they don't owe anything, they didn't do anything. Correct. It's just because they're black in a, in a white neighborhood. Correct. So what do you have that you can show me today? Nothing in this uh, price range, nothing at all. This practice was prevalent between the 1910s and the 60s. The 1948 Shelley v. Kramer Supreme Court decision found racially restrictive covenants can't legally be enforced. Still, the practice continued under the rug. Even after all the, the old racial covenants were uh, stricken down by the Supreme Court, so even though it wasn't, couldn't be enforced in law anymore, there was a sort of an unwritten social contract that if you were going to sell your home, if you were a white homeowner and you were going to sell your home, you would only sell your home to another white homeowner because you wanted to maintain the the current racial structure of the neighborhood. It wasn't until the passing of the 1968 Fair Housing Act that sweeping legislation was designed to end all discriminatory housing. Still, the language can be found in some deeds today. So when you look at redlining and things like restrictive covenants, uh, it was meant to disenfranchise and to segregate. Will you, can you say that it worked? Absolutely, it worked. Well, there's a lot of things that we haven't had because of racism. Housing discrimination was banned on paper, but white realtors would use another concept to alter the racial makeup of neighborhoods now forced to integrate. Real estate agents, white real estate agents, would basically scare the crap out of white homeowners. Here's how they would do it. They would, so for example, Hiring an African-American to drive through the neighborhood playing loud music. Hiring an African-American woman to walk down the neighborhood pushing a stroller with black kids in it. Having an African-American call a white household using a traditional black name and scare the crap out of them. Right? That's blockbusting. This is the one of the councils that... Someone who knows all too well about the practice is former city council member Jim Singleton. So you go through the process, you get the house, everything goes smoothly. And I you, thought it was in a way. So you start to move in. Yeah. What happens? The day I was moving, that was March the, the 13th. I remember that date, 1968, when I was getting ready to move in. The gentleman next door. Keep in mind, it's all white. I'm moving into the middle of a neighborhood that is all white. 
at the time. And he swore that he would never spend a night in the block with a colored person. So I backed up to move in. He backed up with a uh, U-Haul to move out. And the process started from there. The next morning when I woke up and looked outside, there was a, a for sale sign on every house in, in not just this block, but in, the, in this area around. I had heard about it and read about it from other places, <clears throat> but I never had the experience of dealing with it. Blockbusting lent itself to another discriminatory practice called steering. Realtors started steering white folks into certain neighborhoods and black folks into others, um, steering black folks away from certain neighborhoods. They were doing it so that they would put the fear in white individuals so now they can jump to the suburbs where all of the support was coming from the federal government through the FHA and the VHA building suburban homes. While wider suburban families benefited from VA and FHA loans, the Treasury Department says there is evidence to show the FHA rarely insured loans to low-income urban neighborhoods where most black Americans lived in the 1930s. Left in the city's urban core, black families were sold the homes left behind by white families, but at a more expensive rate under less desirable terms. With the limited ability to get capital funding and low-wage jobs, we began to see the impact of white flight. Okay, now here's some homes for you. What are we going to do? charge you higher interest rates, or we're going to allow you to buy it on contract. If you miss one payment, we're going to take the house from you. Guess what? You don't build any equity. I just think that people did not have the, the money or the resources in terms of the, the job that they had and what the payment was and then moving in. You could also see the deterioration to some extent in the property. They just weren't kept up to the level that they had been before. So this story is a giant real estate play. Even the constant moving around of African Americans, when we jump into the period of urban, urban renewal, building of the um, um, uh, Claiborne Bridge, all of that stuff is about a real estate, everything is a real estate play. This area is under investigation again. I'm afraid of dying. How many children was actually tested at Moby School? The EPA should help us. Neighborhoods were built on top of ha hazardous waste sites because under current EPA laws, it's illegal, but it wasn't always illegal. They found seven homes with alarming levels of lead poisoning. Our children don't have a chance. It's been 29 years since the EPA designated the Agriculture Street Landfill, the 95-acre land that housed hundreds of residents and the Desire community as a Superfund site. On that site, the Press Park Apartments, Moton Elementary School, a senior housing complex, and the Gordon Plaza community. We are in no position to be silent about it. 29 years later, residents of Gordon Plaza arrive at the steps of City Hall, sometimes bi-weekly, demanding a fully funded relocation from their homes. So that we may safely move off the toxic landfill that the city of New Orleans built our homes on. While the number of neighbors have dwindled in the community, those left behind say the fully funded relocation is only right, especially since they were steered to the community with the promise of the American dream at an affordable price. Alluring, especially when you've been excluded from other communities for decades. I feel it should be investigated and do the proper thing. This needs to be resolved now. And we're doing the same old crazy, insane things over and over and over again. 
And a lot of times the hazardous waste sites might have been really old sites from the 30s, 40s, or 50s. Then they were, they were, you know, they were, the, the waste was buried, they were paved over. You know, it might have been a vacant piece of land for 10 or 20 years. And then a developer decides, okay, well, you know, I think I'd like to build, uh, you know, housing development on this area. Some of us have died. We're just going to keep fighting, y'all. It's our duty to fight for our freedom. It's our duty to fight for our freedom. It's, it's not if, it's when. Home ownership was a big deal, to, especially for poor black people. I mean, we didn't have a lot coming from the desired project. Jesse Perkins bought into the idea of Gordon Plaza, though he somewhat knew of its past. Did you know that this was a landfill? I knew it was a landfill. Mm -hmm. However, I did not know it was a toxic waste landfill, which is a huge difference. For Jesse, the chance to bid on a home that went up on the auction block in Gordon Plaza was one that meant more to him since his mother never owned a home. The home was paid for, pay the taxes on it, and you're good. You got a roof over your head, Mom. And how old were you at this time? 27 years old. I was living uptown then. You know, I can't even let my grandkids go out. A lot of the people talked about being first-time home buyers, uh, so this was very exciting. Uh, and not thinking at the time, oh, these homes were marketed, low middle income families, but marketed to African Americans only. Really? Yes. And was being marketed by the city's first black mayor. It will neither be a black administration nor a white administration. The plan for Gordon Plaza was carried out through Ernest Dutch Moriel, though he didn't initially introduce the reimagined dump. He did, however, push black residents toward the community. I was the front receptionist at that time for his office. And all of we found out that, okay, they're building houses in our in, in the desired community area. What was it billed to you as? Like, what were they promoting it as? They were promoting it as um, um, affordable houses for low-income black families. But if you ask residents and environmental activists, the affordable housing came with a major cost. I've been sick a lot more since I've been working here. Environmentalists petitioned the EPA to test at Gordon Plaza after nearby Moton Elementary School found lead contamination in the soil. We want to know what are they going to do about it. But the amount wasn't enough to meet the EPA standards based on the hazard ranking system at the time. We found nothing on the school ground. But the Gordon Plaza community began to rumble about the site's past. Passed out brochure or information was provided they went door to door and just in talking to some of the neighbors and receiving flyers on my door that they were holding meetings at the community center. And what did you find or what did you learn? I found I found that people were very displeased because of what they were finding when they dug up their yards to plant vegetables. Well, we knew as you was digging that we knew we was going to find like bottles and stuff. We continued to dig and continued to dig and it, it was a can. How big and was it, it? It was a gasoline can. Okay. But on that gasoline can, it had a skeleton head. So, and it said poison. For more than 50 years, this was the site of a large city landfill although there were no records kept of what was dumped here during that period of time. The EPA comes out again to test the soil after a sewage leak at the Moton School in 1993. By this time, the hazard ranking system had changed. The results were enough to qualify Gordon Plaza, Press Park, and the Moton Elementary School as a Superfund site, despite the EPA telling the community earlier there wasn't a dangerous level of pollutants. Had you known then what you know now, I would you have moved? No, I would not. The school closed in 1994. These people on the school board just were not listening. They wouldn't listen to the report. They wouldn't listen to what the scientists told us. And they just decided that they wanted to build it there and they were going to do it no matter what. 
Years later, people start developing uh, mysterious illnesses and they don't understand why in their clustering in one specific area. After testing the site, chemist Wilma Subra told the Louisiana Weekly, the Agriculture Street landfill is contaminated with arsenic, lead, and polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, among more than 140 toxic materials, at least 49 of which are associated with cancer. I am a a uh, breast cancer survivor. There's a number of people around in, the, in this area that have died of cancer. A 2019 Louisiana tumor registry report also found Gordon Plaza is within the census tract to have the second highest consistent rate of cancer in Louisiana. Though they stopped short of linking those instances to the toxic substances that were found on the ground because they're tough to prove. Aren't you fearful to stay here? Yes, but at the same time, you're going through so much, you know, you're daily living, you can't just jump up and, 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 and move somewhere else. And you're looking for a solution, uh, thinking that everybody will do it the right way. Immediately after the Superfund designation, residents asked to be moved. Instead, the EPA did remedial work, cleaning up and removing some of the soil, putting down a geotextile barrier and topping it with new clean soil. We've had several lawsuits, civil lawsuits, and you're meeting with the politicians, you're meeting with uh, the experts, medical, you're meeting with the attorneys, and then all of it gets just by the wayside. And we owe them to communicate the entire piece, and we will do that. What you can do is come live on the site. This story doesn't have an ending because those meetings are ongoing. You need to use it to move us off toxic land. Over the course of three decades, there have been small inches towards what's considered a victory for these residents. We had no clue. I would have never even purchased, thought about purchasing a home here if I had known that. It required us to fight and toil. We don't need RFP at all. We can move today on what we've already submitted. But until they are moved from the land, the city government pushed them towards they won't be satisfied.